It's on, I think, too. All right. Well, we are live. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another uh, live with me, Ben Rogashan, aka the Seattle Data Guy. Uh, today, we've got uh, David with me. Uh, how are you doing today, David? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks awesome. for having me. Yeah, yeah. No, excited to have you on. Excited to, to talk uh, startups and real-time data. Uh, yeah, I mean, just for everyone out there, do you want to give a quick background on, on you know who you are, what you've done, kind of your, your whole experience? Sure. So I'm Dave Yaffe. I was an engineer at one point in my life, but that's been a long time. Um, since then, uh, I was actually a mechanical engineer and uh, somehow got into the world of digital advertising. I, I ended up working at a couple startups in that space um, and then made the crossover to, to data afterwards. Um, yeah, that's my background. I'm sure we'll get into it a little more later. Yes, yes. Uh, when you're not doing data stuff or mechanical engineering stuff, which it sounds like you don't do anymore, uh, what, do, what do you do for fun? Um, I'm pretty into outdoors, even though I live in New York City, um, which makes it a little bit hard, to be honest. But we try to get a, out to um, hike or bike or run or, you know, something like that a, a few times a week. And then um, we I also really like, you know, mountain climbing, um, traveling. Traveling is you know, something I just got back from Mexico City on Saturday. So mm, nice. that was a pretty nice trip too. Nice, nice. Uh just curious, so mountain climbing is that like in gyms or like legitimate like out in the wilderness? Legitimate out in the wilderness. Ah, I, I right. like uh, you know, longer backpacking trips, um actual, actual rock climbing and mountain climbing outdoors. Uh have you ever hung out with uh what's Ben? I don't remember his last name now. I should remember it. Ben from uh, Data Robot. Or was Data Robot? Not anymore. I don't think so. No. Okay. You should you should go talk to him. He all loves all that extreme stuff, <laughs> like backpacking for days and in, in, in mountain biking or uh, yeah. mountain, mountain climbing. You know, COVID actually kind of was a big problem for that stuff for me because living in New York, it made it really hard to leave, and then just didn't get to do it as much. So I'm I'm a pretty poor rock climber right now. All right. Well. Time, time to get back to it. So, uh, circling back to data, uh, just what kind of your what? Uh, How did you kind of get into data? Um, so, you know, the world of online advertising is actually kind of interesting because um, the data problems there are pretty large, right? Like you you care about very high scale data, with lots of features that come in to make decisions. Um, I had started in um, a company called Right Media. Um, and, and from there, um, went to a company that was very early stage called Invite Media. We were the first what's called real-time bidding platform, or, um, and we were a demand-side platform. Mm -hmm. um, so similar to like what Trade Desk does these days, we just sold a lot earlier than they did, and we sold to Google. Um, but that world, it, you really do care about like very, very fast decisions. Millisecond latency is like all you have to make a decision and, and respond to something. Um, so effectively, I got into data just by being in, in that space on the product side. Mm -hmm. um, but I got a lot more into it when we started the last business, which was called Arbor. Um, and we did, you know, we did something that was pretty non-traditional. Um, we actually built our own streaming system. So that really like sunk me into the deep rabbit hole of everything that is data. Yeah. Um, I, it's interesting because, you know, you're, you're definitely already referencing a lot of uh, real time and, and clearly it's been impacting you for a while, right? Like I think some people feel like it's new today, but I, I, for you, it seems like you've been doing this a long time. So more than anything, like just focusing back on Arbor, like what kind of led you to starting it? Yeah. Um, so we had come from Google, right? We had built um, Invite Media and sold it to Google. And myself and my co-founder, um, we had a, another co-founder as well. We had this thought that basically Google and Facebook had amazing data assets. And publishers and advertisers out there, they, they were just totally relying on Facebook and Google for anything that they wanted. Um, but the funny thing is, like, all that data comes from the publisher and the advertiser. Right? Mm -hmm. Inherently, it's the publisher and advertiser's data. So our view was, what if we could help them be less dependent on, on the kind of like ad tech giants. Um, and that was part of the impetus that started Arbor. Um, we wanted to make a platform that would help them work with these types of data assets, pool it and aggregate it, because individually they, they're a little too small to really be valuable, but mm -hmm. together they, they could. 
Um, and we ended up doing that. Um, so that was a pretty successful um, situation. We, um, we, we essentially built a platform that helped them manage their data um, and get it to publishers had kind of had the data, advertisers wanted it. So we, we built that like trading platform essentially. Yeah. Um, since Arbor kind of relied on, um, you know, essentially the power of a lot of live data feeds, I read in one of your recent posts how you kind of were able to handle that despite, you know, only at the time being kind of at a seed startup stage. Uh, how'd you kind of, I guess, build your infrastructure in a way that kind of balanced both, you know, limited budget, obviously, um, but also, you know, putting out pretty high demands from a, from a data perspective and a feature perspective. Yeah, so that was a really core decision that we made early on, and it was a bit of a strange one, to be honest. Um, we looked at the needs of, of our business, and we um, back at Google, we had done a study which showed that um, I think the numbers were like, if you could get back in front of a, a user after they took an action, so after they go to a website, you'd get about a 65% higher chance of them buying the product. Right? Mm. If you do it within seconds or minutes instead of within hours or days um, and hours or days is kind of the standard. Yeah. Um, so we decided from the ground up, we wanted that type of advantage uh, and we thought it would be super valuable to us. And so that's the reason that the real time thing was important for us. It's a, it's honestly, it's a bit impractical at this point for, for a startup company to be thinking that way, because most real time systems take several engineers just to, to water them, right? Like to nurture and maintain them. Yeah. Um, and that's the core disadvantage with a real time system. Um, especially if you're managing the infrastructure, you need multiple components like Kafka and Debezium, and you need, um, you need to like string them all together in, in a way, and you might even need to like do a transformation system and all this stuff has to be managed and maintained. So for us, that wasn't really an option. We were a seed stage startup. We'd raised an okay amount of money, but you know, this wasn't, um, this wasn't, uh, 2020, this was, this was like 2014. Um, so we didn't have enough for, for that type of thing. Um, and we decided to do something even more non-traditional, which was to um, build our own streaming system mm. because we didn't think that it would be cost effective to run another one. Um, there was a second consideration that went into that. And this is a little bit more technical and a little bit more in depth, which is um, most of the time when you run a streaming system, that's like half of what you run. You mm -hmm. also run a batch system. Yeah. Um, and that's called a Lambda architecture, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, we didn't want that, right? We didn't want to have a Lambda architecture because that's twice as much stuff to run and to keep in sync with each other. So when something happens and one gets out of sync, which inevitably will happen, you have to true it up and, and it's, it's a lot of work. So our motivation for, you know, essentially building Gazette, because that was the open piece of software that we built that was a streaming system um, and still is, um, was to solve that problem. Um, and we ended up building the system Gazette. It's now an open source uh, project out there. Um, it solves the problem. It did it really well for us. Um, it, it's And it's um, live with some public companies out there right now. Nice, nice. Uh, I, I think, um, so basically for you guys, you kind of did all your your transforms all your processing through through gazette right like there was no didn't even touch batch is that correct um that is the case yeah, yeah so nice. what, what gazette did was it, it assembled a graph of users mm -hmm. all of the touch points for users so we could traverse that graph in real time when we got a call and then look at all the data points that we had on a, on a user and that's how it worked effectively um which yeah that's it, it was complex and it was hard to build. And, you know, like, obviously that's not something that's for the, for the, um, for the faint of heart to take on. <laughs> yes. I, I can imagine it was, it was definitely a challenge. Were there any, are, are there any misconceptions you kind of see with the streaming and real time data kind of today? Um, you know, cause again, that was 2014. I feel like we always go through kind of similar iterations where, you know, I probably started in data in 2014 or 2013. Um, and, you know, real time was the holy grail back then. It still feels kind of the same way today. Um, do you feel like there's any misconceptions that are kind of floating around the space? Yeah, I do. Um, but there's also a lot of true conceptions, um, right? Like streaming is hard. Um, and it's hard for, for really um, reasonable reasons. 
Um, the biggest problem I think with it is that there's a lot of gotchas in the space. Um, so, you know, we live in a world where you, the comparatively you, can, you have to compare it to the modern data stack, right? Cause that's how you're working with data otherwise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the modern data stack, you have pluggable connectors that are pre-built by vendors. Um, they're fully managed with composable data sets that are discoverable within an org with your, within your data warehouse. Um, so it's, it's a pretty big um, difference in, in mindset from how you're actually working with the two things. And I think that's the reason for it, right? Like these, you have to have, at this point, you have to have a, a pretty valid use case to work with streaming data. So the practitioners are kind of right, right? Like the streaming data is hard to work with. And that's part of the reason that we, we started the company um, so that we can change that paradigm. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there Are there any like, um, like for, for data engineers and practitioners out there, are there any like mindset, mindset shifts they kind of need kind of going from batch to streaming or perhaps, you know, um, are there any mental models you think they kind of need to shift? I think they shouldn't have to, right? Like that's the core problem, right? They're currently in the world today, there are a lot of gotchas and there are a lot of mental model shifts that you have to make whenever you move from batch to streaming. Um, you have to take into account things like, you know, Kafka is a buffer and it only has recent data. Um, and you have to take into account things like windowing um, when you're doing transformations. You can't look at all of your data historically. You have to do stateful transforms that only look at, you know, a certain amount of data. Um, but I don't think that's the way it should work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like for streaming to actually go mainstream, if we want that to happen, I, I liken it to a book that I read a, a long time ago, way before we started this company. Um, which is called the innovators dilemma. Mm -hmm. Have you heard, have you read that? I've heard of it. Haven't read it. So basically what they do is they walk through technological shifts, paradigm shifts that happen over time. And, um, you know, essentially what usually happens, and this has happened many, many times throughout history. I'll give you one example, magnetic disks, magnetic disks used to be the way that we stored information and solid state disks were way more expensive. Um, and, you know, until solid state disks actually got better, faster, cheaper, it wasn't mainstream. Um, mm -hmm. And that technology wasn't mainstream. But now we don't think about magnetic disks. In fact, now we're thinking like, should we use flash memory instead? Um, right? Like, instead of SSDs. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of the way that these technology shifts happen. They, they generally do get better, faster, cheaper. I think that's the type of thing that we have to get to so that the ergonomics are just as good or better than than batch um, yeah. when we're talking about streaming. Um, otherwise, practitioners just won't want to use it. Um, and the only time that it will be used is on a use case basis where, you know, that use case makes X dollars and you can justify spending Y dollars because X is greater than Y. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it makes sense. I think this is kind of like not it, it's slightly different than the post i posted earlier but like the the whole like rust versus python versus scala kind of discussion where it's like it's not just about you know improved efficiency or whatever it might be it's also about um making sure it's easier to work with whatever it is it's like it's also about you know making tools because we're humans we we like tools that more people can use you know I, I was liking it to like you know in the past it was like if you're really strong uh, you could be helpful because you could lift heavy things and then we figured out or we could make things that make lifting heavy things easier and now we've, we've reduced how strong people need to be to lift something very heavy in the same way you know you have to be you used to be like you know, super uh, smart to be programming because you'd be programming in assembly or something, you know, really low level. And now it's like Python has definitely like, you know, made that more accessible to a wider array of people. So I think that's, that's kind of the same thing you're saying here with streaming. It's like, we should just make it in such a way that it's like, there isn't this huge mental leap, um, but that anyone can do it. Not that's... anyone, but a broader range of people. Right. Yeah. Uh, it would be nice if anyone could do it. If it yes. was configuration driven and a business person could just get some insights through yes. SQL or something, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, pulling up my, so I, I'd say, like, you know, is, is that kind of what led you to, I'd, I'd say, starting uh, Estuary? Um, yeah, that's the, so early on we were evaluating, you know, we truly do believe that Gazette is like a better mousetrap, right? Gazette is, uh, it has real advantages over Kafka and, you know, of course, Kafka purists would debate this all day with me. So 
not going to have that conversation, but like I'll give you some high level touch points. One is natively backed by cloud storage. Um, that means that the, the brokers can store data on, on in cloud storage. They don't really have to store any data locally. Mm -hmm. You can scale up brokers ephemerally. You can mm -hmm. add a broker and it's just compute. That's all you care about. It indexes data, hands off, you know, they handle all that together. Um, but they're essentially just compute. Um, and it also means that like, you don't have to treat it like a buffer. If you want to use it as a, um, a full retention of data so that you can um, rehydrate new views that you're creating in the future um, with both historical and real-time data, you can do that super efficiently because you can re read right out of cloud storage without going to a broker as an intermediary, which is mm. a lot faster. So we, we do think that it's a bit of a better mousetrap. But when we thought about like, should we go and manage this thing versus should we make a real product around it? We kind of had to choose the latter for a few reasons, but like one of the biggest ones is, um, you know, otherwise it's still gonna be infrastructure and you're gonna need experts who, have, who know how to run and deploy that infrastructure. We need to change that model. We need to change it. Otherwise like streaming will never be truly mainstream. Maybe you can build a great enterprise tool that only enterprises will use mm. uh, in that way, but otherwise it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's kind of the, the, the world we live in today where it's like either enterprise or, you know, big tech company can kind of, can oh. kind of deal with streaming, but like smaller companies e either have to kind of deal with like workarounds or like quick plug and play options that are like, aren't, aren't as maybe fully like there. So yeah, I, I definitely see that. Or that solve a use case, right? They, they focus on a single use case. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The problem is solved. Yeah, you're right. That's yeah. Um, speaking of all, all of these other options, because again, we're, we are in this world where if I were to take every stream, in fact, I think you did make a post about like all these different streaming options, um, and, and kind of where you fit, uh, what, what do you think, where do you think you guys fit compared to everyone else? How do you, how do you kind of think of yourselves? Um, well, I think that like in this world, there's, there's a lot of options, right? There's a lot of open source pieces of technologies. There's some really good ones. Um, you know, like, um, Apache Beam is a really interesting one where you can look at both historical um, batch data and you can look at streaming data. Um, but a lot of them have the gotchas that I was talking about, right? And they're, they're difficult to manage. Um, they're not targeting necessarily being a fully managed tool. There are flavors of fully managed versions of some of them. But if you want end-to-end -end value, you're going to have to assemble a line of items and kind of make sure that you know how to use them, integrate them together, and, and um, you know, get value out of them together. We um, want to be an end-to-end -end data pipeline that helps with streaming. That does three things. It captures data from sources. So mm -hmm. it uses the Red Ahead log for databases, and it actually manages that whole process. Um, consequently, we're not using Debezium. We've rolled our own CDC, which is a little bit weird. Um, it does transformations. Um, and then it also keeps low latency views of your data up to date and across various systems. Um, so in that way, it is the full data pipeline. You don't have to integrate anything else. We do like working with, you know, um, real time analytics databases because those are, those are great to work with um, for high speed querying and stuff. But in general, we can also work with low latency with, with um, systems that are not custom designed for low latency. Right. So that's, that's kind of a key differentiator. We we can work with um, data that's coming with very from lar very large volumes out of a Google out of um, sorry a database, and then capture um, and aggregate it and put it into a Google Sheet at a weight rate that's not going to um, overwhelm it. Okay. You know the the runtime's doing all that for you by by taking the data and aggregating it and rolling it up. So yeah. it's it's um it intends to be like a much easier one shop stop, uh, one stop shop for all of those problems um, combined. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, do you, I was gonna ask, do you, sorry, not, did you have something else to say before? Just one other thing is like, um, there's some little things about it that, you know, some people find really valuable, others don't care about. Like right. one example is um, in general, streaming systems require windows. And, yeah. you know, we, we make it so that you don't have to do a window. You can actually 
look at his, you can roll up historical lifetime value for a customer and look across all your interactions with them ever, um, which is a, a bit of a different paradigm. Um, so do you guys like kind of, a, it feels like building your own <laughs> things. Um, cause you just, you, you, you know, you built cause that, uh, it sounds like you built your own CDC. Um, is that just kind of a thing that you and your, your team tend to like? No, we, we tried to use Debezium to be, to be honest. Um, we really did try. <laughs> we can get into that at another time, but, um, there, there were sane rational reasons that we ended up not doing it. Um, and part, part of it is just like, we want exact semantics end to end in the system so that we don't have any any gotchas that you don't have in a then in batch systems um so you know we we made some decisions based on that but in general um i we do like using um strong open source pieces of technology out there um, especially me being more on the business side mm -hmm. uh, you know i'm trying to uh, capitalize on previous works wherever we possibly can yeah. But, um, you know, it's not always practical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the, the data world is still relatively new. So um, there's still a lot of things that you can make changes to. I mean, Airflow, I, I was like, I'm always surprised at how young Airflow is. Like, I, I think I found it like a year after they made it public and it's already being challenged. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can still be challenged today that make sense to be challenged. So, yeah, for sure. But I'm sure uh, your bottom line <laughs> doesn't like when you're like, how many uh, engineering hours do we need to put towards this project where we're building an entirely new CDC? Um, so. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then you know, there's there's obviously like if you can attach yourself to a great open source project that's being developed and, and improved, that's wonderful because you get all the the work that's going into that project as well. Yeah. So yeah, we, we would love to do that in, in places, um, but. <laughs> not not everywhere. You know, currently there's no streaming airflow uh, at this point. So that's something that we also had to do ourselves, essentially, because if you want to do, to, if you want to create a, a DAG within a streaming model, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? There's, there's yeah. really no option now. Yeah, yeah. I was like, is, is that something you guys are covering right now just for yourselves or just externally as well? That's part of the product. So yeah. essentially, when you create a data product, it can be derived from previous data products, mm. um, and one or many, one or more, you can uh, transform it uh, through a derivation, and that can be changed as much as you want. So essentially, it routes events, and and um, and it's able to transform them multiple times as hops within within that system. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I guess going bigger picture here, you know, um, the data world. Again, constantly changing. Uh, where do you kind of see things next five years? That's probably the, the best window we could even guess. <laughs> it's a hard question. Uh, well, there's one really easy answer that I can give right away, which is consolidation, right? Yeah. Um, in the last few years, years, there's been tons of money dumped into various different projects. And um, a lot of them are really great. Um, but a, a customer should not have to put five vendors together to derive value. And, mm. and that's kind of an issue. So I think we're going to see more holistic solutions in the next five years yeah. come out of it. Um, another thing that I would love to see is that the words real time um, streaming and batch will go away. And okay. we won't be thinking about that because everyone will just have access to <laughs> all of their data. At yeah. um, that's another, maybe, maybe um, SAS, SaaS is going to dominate the world. I really, I believe that fully. What I've been mostly surprised about recently is just how many enterprises that you never thought would get in, on board with SaaS actually. Mm. Um, and that's been really, really interesting to see. It's been nice. And I think there's like actually amazing reasons for it, right? You, if you're building um, and deploying software into a customer's VPC or in, into their on-prem environment, you're wasting lots and lots of cycles just getting that right. And you're not innovating. You're yeah. you're spending your engineering cycles for your smartest people, troubleshooting problems that are just like integration problems. Yes, there's definitely like that is still a major issue. Um, I mean, I, I was thinking like as, as you brought like real time because like that. I, you might have posted about this, but I think I've made a post about this where it's like you know even the concept of like data connectors as they currently are are 
arguably being challenged by things like Salesforce and Snowflake saying they're going to partner together and just have your data in Snowflake, right? Like it's, it's almost real, like it's basically real time, right? Like what if your data just existed there? Um, I, I, I think about how much time I've spent in my life creating SFTP, like, pro, you know, whatever, not connectors, but just like automates, automated programs to be like, okay, pull from SFTP, load into our data warehouse, which means someone on the other side created the opposite one of like push to SFTP so I could pull to it, um, pull from it and then, um, you know, load it into, into the data warehouse. And then now you've got duplicate data and all these other things where it's like, yeah, there's so many efficiencies that could just be managed away um, where, yeah, data just kind of exists um, for various reasons, whether it's through streaming, whether it's through just direct data connections or data sharing, whatever. Um, I definitely can kind of see that continuing. So do you think ELT is going to go away or EPL? Or whatever you want to call it? <laughs> I, I don't think it's anytime soon, right? Like, I think this is like, it, it takes time, right, for, for any of these shifts to happen. You, you brought up like the innovator dilemma. And at first I thought we were going to go with was um, like, whenever I've read about like innovation, it's always been slower than people feel like the I think it was like I was reading about the car engine and it was like every 10 years or five years someone added another piece to it right like it was like oh, okay someone built the initial engine but it had this problem mm -hmm. five years later someone created this like doohickey <laughs> and put it onto the engine and then it solved that problem but now there was this new problem and it was just this constant like iteration um to, to get to where we are um and I think that's kind of data the data world today too it's like it's constant like iteration where it's like okay we have this new problem how do we solve it okay let's add this other thing and then like again let's consolidate okay okay now we have this other problem you make a product uh okay can we stick that somewhere okay let's put that in so um maybe yeah. it'll go away it'll probably change something and, and you also have the other side of that which is like when discoveries are made a lot of the times they happen in the same same exact time in three different places in the world yeah and, you know that i was reading a book uh, about like um, RNA sequencing and, and that that would seem like a very common thing in that process. But, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think I overall agree with you. It, it's going to be an interesting thing to see. Probably the long tail of integrations, they won't go anywhere, but the the top, the head. Yeah. It, it's going to get a lot easier to do those. Yeah, I, I think it's just gonna make a lot of sense. There's a lot of money there for other people to make and a lot of ways we can reduce it and Make it cheaper and just yeah try try to simplify it i assume um, yeah but, but yeah that'll be exciting um the question that sometimes people shy away from but i'm curious to ask is uh, are there any terms in the data world that you kind of wish would go away um maybe elt <laughs> yeah i just don't like the term elt i feel like it's a silly term right? like yes if you read our website you'll see elt on it <laughs> yes i wrote that <laughs> But what? I don't like the term because it's silly. It's like there's no such thing. Um, yeah, there's a, there's some such thing, right? Like you can actually do that, but generally speaking, you're normalizing data before it's going somewhere. Yeah. Um, and and it's a I think it's a powerful concept um, as far as like an indication of a way that you think about working with data, um, doing a lot of you know transformations within your data warehouse. But in general, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> makes sense. I, I, I can see that. I think like, like you said, what often ends up happening is like either, I think some people have described it as in like E small T L T, right? Like you do yeah. something first and then you, you end up loading it. Um, you know, it's, uh, it is interesting. Cause again, I've, I've definitely written my fair share of articles and then you're like, but really, what am I doing whenever I write this pipeline? I'm still doing some sort of like clean up or transform. So it, yes. Yeah. So it's always like some interesting nuance that you can always dive into where it's like yeah it, it's never that clear cut so you know there's another one that's almost along the same lines right like if we're going to be pedantic which i guess that last one was it would be the word real time right like mm -hmm. real time doesn't mean anything if i was a high frequency trader real time means microseconds if i'm you know a, an engineer it probably means milliseconds and and if i'm a business person it probably means like minutes or something um and those those do not align with each other at all so it's um, the, the problem is there's no better term for it, right? Like the, you can call it streaming, which doesn't necessarily mean very much more, um, but there's, there's no great term. Yeah. 
yeah i, I kind of like like i feel like there's there's a whole article i okay, i'm gonna need to write on that because like i i remember uh bite bite go and i think a few people have written articles about like different latency between like different processes inside of like your computer um and I think there's almost like you just kind of set up like between use cases where it's like, what is real time? Uh, you know, microseconds, milliseconds um, you know, for a business person, sometimes hours, sometimes days, sometimes quarterly. Right. It's like for a high level executive, if you're making decisions every day on some strategic decision, you're probably ma making them too frequently. You know, it's like right. you should probably be making these every quarter, maybe or reviewing them every quarter and making them every six months. Like, yeah, there's, there's, there's interesting. What do you think of the term data app? <laughs> uh it's it's definitely interesting it'll like so far to me I, i've mostly seen people build like maybe more dashboards with it like 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 and yeah. even kind of put that underneath I, I do think some people are trying to build things that are a little more data app like um there's just the biggest issue i think most data practitioners have with it and i have with it as well is like it comes with the um I don't know where I'm, it's eluding me. Um, but just basically that like, you need high quality data to do it, right? Like if you want to build this, okay. But most of the time, most data warehousing systems aren't, don't have perfect data. And so if you want to build a data app off of it, unless your data is of the highest quality, you're, you're posing a lot of risk. So even if you build something that is an application based off of, you know, more of an application application, it's like, are you 100% sure that, that all that information is accurate? It's like, well... 90 95 <laughs> it definitely so. makes it easier to get something going and iterate on it but yeah. um, versus like building a, a pipeline in code or something but yeah i agree with you in general it's yeah. uh and the word is a bit confusing i think too because i you know you and i know what it means but if you hear the word data app does does it mean anything to you uh, i don't know that that one's a little rough to me well, there's there's been a lot of new terms uh or, or new terms old terms that have been thrown around in the last like six months <laughs> yeah. that we're all kind of just juggling nowadays where we're like okay what do all these words mean do i need to know what it means uh do i need to care about it now or is this something i need to care about later it's it's been i feel bad for people joining this space uh recently because they, they have even less kind of i think frame to understand what's going on i am um, yeah just... how many times do you have to see a word or a phrase before you actually like dive into what it what it means this is you know i i feel like for me usually what ends up happening is I end up doing something and then a year later I hear a term I'm like, Oh, that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> like data mesh. I was like, Oh yeah, that's what we did at Facebook. We didn't call it that. We just did it. We just did what we did because that's what made sense. Um, yeah, which, you know. That's great that you could do it. It's probably unlikely for a lot of other smaller companies, but yeah. And yeah. I, I, I think that's usually the, the thing that, that people struggle with is like, when does it become practical for my company to do it? Um, right. Like CICD, does it make sense for a startup of two people to have a full blown CICD process? No, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> um, but yeah, you definitely need to have some real use cases that require a lot of stability for something like that. Yeah. Um, but what about data mesh? Do you think that that's something that's going to be handled via technology or should it be like more of a cultural thing mm, that's that, that's kind of an interesting question right um o only because like there i know there are people who are like looking at like starting startups in the space and like sometimes like at least from what i've understand data mesh it, it almost fits more in the agile category where it's like this set of processes that yeah. makes sense and maybe there's some pieces of technology you can build within that right like because with agile or scrum you've got kanban boards you've got you know Jira, like other things you've kind of built around it but there's no like specific technology that's been built that's like this is agile right mm -hmm. um so i imagine there's components that are required to help manage it um but for the most part it feels process oriented but that, that it does, and it feels like it's unlikely for you to get an entire org onto the same style of technology, right? Like that's one of the core issues. Your org probably doesn't know the same technology, so unless you can do the whole thing in SQL, it's it's probably unlikely that it would happen. Um, but maybe that's the answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, according uh, to Val, it it will be both. One will enable the other, another, which you know, like I said, it, there probably will be components that that help. Uh, the process part, because usually process needs something, some sort of technology to like make it a little smoother. Um, but because we humans are really bad at following process, we're we're very lazy. <laughs> we need 
We're glad we're ingesting the process and even understanding what it's supposed to be, like spending that time on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of us like we kind of know what we're supposed to do, but if there isn't like technology to kind of like push us in the right direction, sometimes we'll be like, eh, do we have yeah. to follow this process we've developed? It's like, yeah, you probably should. Yeah, that's the reason that like um, ticket templates and stuff are a thing, right? Like, yeah. we know that we're supposed to give background on on what the problem was, but we damn well like to just describe it, describe what happened. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and not do reproduction steps. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, inherently, we build all this stuff so we can be lazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that was actually my other reference with, um, I'll bring up this question here in a second, but that was my other reference with uh, the post earlier with cars and like Python. It's like, look, at the end of the day, we're just lazy. Like bikes are more efficient, but cars are just easier <laughs> it's easier to drive uh, i guess you're in new york so maybe that's different but you know if you're yeah. anywhere else in the states you know it's just so much easier subway is way better honestly yeah or but, well subway's at least a little more efficient <laughs> yeah the subway is incredible it's like everyone who comes to new york hops in an uber and then is late to their first meeting they have in new york you just need to go in the subway that's my advice Yes, I, I I think that the first day we we landed because we, we hung out recently. Uh, definitely took an Uber. It was like twenty some minutes. <laughs> Should probably go like a mile and a half or something or two miles. You know, it's like far. I was like, yeah, I was like, to my girlfriend I was like, we could walk. She's like, I'm really tired. We have suitcases. I was like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, so yeah, eventually we found the subway and we're like, this is so efficient, especially since they've added um, Apple Pay. Um, that just yeah. is so nice. You don't have to buy a card. You just like click done. So much simpler. So it simple. Is the best. Yeah. Um, all right. So talking about data engineering, uh, most content on data engineering seems aimed at big tech DE uh, for someone in a med tech startup uh, with people with a technical background, but not data engineers. What tech stack would you recommend? And they're specifically starting with like uh, the uh, like Snowflake, Databricks, maybe Center, and then going out from there. That's a good question. Um, I think... It sounds like a technical background means no SQL. That's what I'd Im imagine. Yeah. And not what likes to code. Because I've actually seen some industries come into data and they, they don't want to use you know Python and, and SQL. They want to use other um, types of technologies to do transformations. And that's that's an interesting you know thing that I've kind of seen a little bit more recently. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, my, my advice here is like, I guess it, it depends. D Databricks is really great if you know how to use spark yeah yeah <laughs> um so it, yeah that, it, that's the reason to use databricks if you have like really big data use cases and um you you want to be able to do that that's for me that's the reason i'm curious to get your thought yeah no i i think that's 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 usually what i tell people it's like look snowflake will work out of the box tomorrow um you can just be a sql user and understand how to use mostly like you won't maybe you might run up your bill a little bit because you're not setting it up as well as as efficiently as you can, but your queries will run fast. Uh, Databricks will require a little more love. Like you need to understand a little more of what's going on. You need to understand Delta Delta Lake itself, a little bit about Spark. Um, like I, I did something where I just inserted my rows one by one versus like inserting a file all at once. And one query ran in seconds or milliseconds. And the other one ran in minutes. And mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know what I did underneath. I assume something happened. Um, I didn't look into it, but that's, that's the thing. It's those little things in Databricks that you will run into. Um, I assume you can make it cheaper, uh, but then Snowflake, but that, that is the difference is you will likely spend a little more time um, on, on setting it up. Also just the feel of both. Snowflake feels like it was built for data management people. Databricks feels like it was built for people that like notebooks. And that, yeah. That's just kind of the core of other parts. Like, look, if you like notebooks, you're going to like Databricks. If you like more SQL -y data management stuff, you're going to like uh, Snowflake. Obviously they're both trying to converge on that. Currently, you know, I think Snowflake just announced even better integration with Python or whatever, but that, that's kind of the difference I see. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm curious, you know, taking that a little further, what about BigQuery or Redshift on, on your side? BigQuery is the other one I'll usually recommend for people. Yeah. Redshift, I'll usually stray away from. It's just, it still like has weird one off things that like, Maybe, maybe for bigger enterprise, it's fine because you have enough data engineers to manage that. But for, for small companies, it's just all these weird one-off things. I don't remember if I read recently if they finally added merge. They might have. But that was like one thing that forever was like, in order to run a merge, you must run an upsert, which makes it sound like it's an actual clause. And it's like, it's not a clause. It's a process. Um, so 
it's just one of those things. I think they might have added it finally, but I, I have not looked. <laughs> yeah. I've been what I really like about Snowflake personally is just the the granularity of managing it. Yeah. Um, managing costs, right? They they make it really obvious around how you can do that stuff. Um, and in a way that, you know, even BigQuery, which I do like, um, doesn't, right? Like BigQuery, if you issue the wrong query, it's just going to give you the results and you're going to pay a lot of money for it. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is very much just like a, like a lot of other, I feel like Google things, it's very, very black boxy and abstracted away from you. And I think it's like the interesting thing about it is, is it feels like it's a great technical solution to the problem. If you are Google and you have like 11 million servers or whatever they have that are just sitting around to, to solve these problems at, at however you want, but it doesn't necessarily translate to the great customer product. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, another question. How would you get started into streaming or working with real time data? I guess. Any thoughts? I think, yeah, this is, this is a good question. I mean, obviously I'm a weird person to ask because we built our own streaming system for that. Um, there are some decent managed products um, out there that, that solve specific use cases. And I would probably think about that. I'd think about like what my use case was, if it's getting data from a database and, and put, putting it into somewhere and it's, yeah, I'm not doing any transformations or doing anything complex. I'd probably just go and use the managed product to start off. Um, I think it takes a lot to justify the investment that it, that you need to actually bring the entire thing in house. And that's the thing that I'd stray away from until I really proved out that, that um, it was the right thing. You know, another answer that I could give you would be talk to me, but that, that's probably not what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. I, I think for them, they're specifically, uh, they, they post this as well. So like finding like uh, resources for like spark streaming flink. Um, sorry, I should have had this other part, but if you have not, that, uh, like, yeah, it's, um, there's probably some tutorials out there. I've I've not put out any personally. So yeah, yeah. Go go work for Airbnb <laughs> or Netflix. I know Netflix is big into to Flink. So yeah, it's, that's, those... a, that's a really good one. <laughs> You'll definitely learn it quickly with with those things. But um, yeah, I think the best thing that we've found is just like their docs, which is sad but true. Uh, the more senior you become, the more you're just like I just get used to reading docs. Let's. <laughs> Uh, any thoughts on ClickHouse? I think it's a really powerful piece of technology. Um, and it's, it's definitely something like we have how many well-funded data warehouse companies that are based on ClickHouse? There's uh, ClickHouse. There's what Firebolt, I think, is based on ClickHouse. Yeah, I think uh, Tiny Bird. Yeah. So, yeah. so that it's, I, there's, there's reasons for that. The, the benchmarks that I read on it are like always insane. Um, I think I think it's a pretty amazing piece of tech. Yeah. Since um, more of a question, I don't know if you've got something for DE, but what's what's interesting about your DE job? I like my current task at work where I have query data with Power Query, um, but don't know if it's interesting enough for a career to be in DE. I don't know. Did you do DE work? I know you did more engineering work, so I'm just curious. I did more engineering work, to be honest. Um, I've yeah, I feel like this is a great and uh, question for the Seattle data guy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, you know, for for data engineers, um, what I usually say is like, if you enjoy not being in front of people, uh, data engineering can be nice because a lot of the work we do tends to be a little bit behind the scenes. Um, you know, we we tend to build the the data infrastructure for everyone else to use. We, it can be pro or con. We're we're, we're the more of the middle child where software engineering teams build stuff. We pull the data from it, and then data science and data analysts complain when the data is not right to us. Uh, <laughs> You can love it or hate it. I, I feel like it's one of those things that like you you either love this kind of work or you don't, and um, you, you you'll figure it out. I, I feel like it's always worth worth poking at. Um, I feel like that's that's the story about being an engineer, though, in general, right? Like you have you're kind of caught in the middle between a, a lot of different personas, yeah. Um, and you're you're always feeling like you you better hope you're working with people that you really like to work with. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's kind of the key to any job though <laughs> yes in my experience yes yeah and, and and with any job there's always things you dislike like you know are there data engineers have to do migrations software engineers have to do migrations which are like most of our time honestly it's either you're ma you're managing and maintaining what currently exists or you're migrating to the next thing 
Uh, very rarely are you building anything unless you work at a company that's got so much budget that they can afford for you to work on some sort of open source project. Um, it's which... amazing how early you start doing migrations. Like, with... <laughs> It's like the second thing. Right after you deploy your first feature, you're going to do your first migration, basically. <laughs> exactly. It's like it's always just like, uh, I don't know if you've read, the Pragmatic Engineer has a good article where he's like, I don't, again, he, he puts so much effort into it he put a ton of, of effort into just gathering how different companies did their migrations where you like talk about very specific like this is how linkedin like migrated off whatever data system they were using um and yeah it's just such a project that exists for various reasons for anyone who wants to know it's sometimes just because <laughs> sometimes it's cheaper sometimes technology is getting sunset Sometimes a VP is moving in and needs to make a thing that they say they won. So they're like, we're going to migrate because that's what I feel like doing. And I think that's how I'm going to get promoted. Um, there's so many reasons, but. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, and sometimes it's for legitimate reasons, like your data model is wrong and you just need to like change your data model. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and, and like you just referenced, there's, there's different types of uh, migrations, like data model, uh, technology, uh, code, like code base. Yeah. Uh, updating a code base like from python 2 to python 3 like it's just endless endless migrations uh so here someone had if you enjoy the need to constantly explain the value of what you do you know? <laughs> 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 oh man uh, just a little bit i mean i i feel like you as a data engineer your value is very much appreciated to some degree but also sometimes yeah, it's, it can feel like it's not it's we're always in the way. I think that's what most people feel. It's like we're always in the way of getting people the answers that they need. And it's just like, we're just trying to do our job and get you accurate data, not just data. Um, and, you know, be able to reproduce this process that you're trying to do every day and not just, you know, once pulled to an Excel sheet. So I think um, like the trend that we're seeing, I don't know if you have noticed this too, is that um, there was a huge trend towards like analytics. Um, and data engineering now seems like it's the hot thing. And it, for good reason, I think it's uh, you just need to have good data coming in to actually get any value out of it. Um, so, yeah, I agree, though. Yeah, it's the whole um, uh, what do you call it? Um, cart before the horse situation where it's like everyone was like, oh, Facebook and Google and all these big tech companies are doing data science. We need to do that um, without really looking under the hood and being like, oh, but underneath the hood. They have like data infrastructure that they've been building for the last almost decade um, right. with, you know, with people managing it. Um, so now they're like, okay, we should probably have some data engineers here who can build that, manage it, maybe do some data platform engineers and so on. So, yeah. yeah. You look at the data that comes from like their APIs, it actually has like primary keys and it, <laughs> it, uh, it's pretty, pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, someone said, joined a new org a couple months ago, completed onboarding, and my first project is migration. Oh. Yep, that is that is our life. <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> that's like that's the first project you give to someone that you don't like very much. No. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you you learn to deal with them. They're just part of it. Um yeah. someone else was just like, Yeah, Kevin, that's part of the job. Uh, gotta explain your value. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have any tips on recommending like because you're, you're kind of an engineer who's gone more business side how people like explain the value of what they're doing to, for, for uh, you know throughout to, the management yeah um, I think it's good to develop relationships where you can because you know upper management probably wants to know what you're doing they want to talk to you um, so if you can develop those types of relationships a lot of the times you'll get put you on more important projects too um, so I personally like doing that. I think, you know, management is kind of a, a weird thing in, in general, because managers are usually thrust into that role from individual contributor roles. And most of the time they have no experience doing, being a manager. So when you like, think about them as people, they're, they're legitimately just where you are, but a few years uh, later in their career, most of the time. And, and for that reason, you know, you can you can really if you do think about them that way, you'll you'll empathize with them a lot more and you'll understand, you know, their motivations and their goals for the most part. Um, that's at least my experience. Um, I find that there's a lot of things about like working and dealing with your manager. I think be noisy. I, I, it's it's better. Everyone wants to hear from you. As, like personally, I want to hear from my employees as um, a, a, you know manager. I want to know what they think, and I don't want to have to guess what they're thinking because. Yeah. 
I can only fix something if, if, um, if that's the case. And the more that I hear from them, like up to a certain level, the better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think it goes both ways. I think you're referencing it in a way of like if they need help or or if something's wrong, but just as much as when you accomplish things, um, this was something I definitely had to learn it like with Facebook, right? Like especially when you're competing with a thousand other oh, <laughs> data engineers. I, I think I have, I, I think I heard you talk about this on your your podcast where you're like yeah. oh, all this bureaucracy, and but it's true. It's like there's a thousand other people doing work. Are you really doing more important work than a thousand other people? You kind of have to tell everyone your work is important because no one else cares. <laughs> yep. the, promotion fun fact. Fact. the promotion process can be quite a slog if you're not doing that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really important to get in front of it so that like, you know, that's the, one, what I will say about, you know, most big companies is that self promotion is the thing that gets you ahead. And I, I, I don't love that about big companies, but um, it, it's true. It's just the way it works, right? Like no one's going to promote you unless you promote you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it, working, I've worked at startups before at least one and yeah, it's like when you, if you don't deliver uh, your company fails and you get fired probably, but like company fails, right? Like that, that that's, that's different at Facebook or yeah, at Facebook, like maybe you deliver something useful this half, maybe you don't. <laughs> More than likely, things will be fine um, yeah. for the company, uh, right? Like, it's, it's big enough. And and so that's why you have to, like, one, you should believe in what you're doing. Like, obviously, don't do things just for whatever. But two, no one else believes in it. <laughs> and they don't know because everyone's, like, concerned with what they're doing. They, yeah. No matter how much, how empathetic they are, they're, they're still the center of their own world most of the time. Yeah. And everyone wants to get promoted. Everyone wants to, you know, um, whatever. So... For anyone out there who's trying to find value or, or drive value at businesses, that's that's part of it. It's like you find things that are valuable, make sure there's a use case for it and a business case for it, but also realize no one else cares <laughs> besides <laughs> besides you and maybe your manager because you know they they hopefully want a promotion too, which is we're all people, we're all human. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Does anyone have any other questions? We're we're kind of coming up here on the hour. Um, I don't know, D David. Do you have any other any things that you're thinking on? Good question. Um, curious, you know, I'd love to hear more about you and, you know, what, what you're doing like these days. You asked me a lot of questions. So. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free. No, it's, um, I mean, most of what I do right now is, uh, again, hands-on end-to-end -end consulting for people of some way or another with data infrastructure. Um, sometimes it's very like high level where I just do like solutions recommendations, like, Hey, you should maybe consider Databricks or Snowflake or, you know, based on your specific use case. Sometimes that means I'm actually implementing it. Sometimes it's just, you know, they're just looking for their engineers to implement it. Um, you know, helping people kind of find the right, like solutions as well, or solutions in terms of like actually coding a solution. Um, I'm trying to think what other things. What would it take for you to get into um, the more um, operational side versus the consulting side? Like, like you mean going into a startup? <laughs> Starting a company, going to a startup. Oh, like well, that. going yeah. to start a startup. I think I, I just have to have an idea I really believed in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think most of my ideas are, are currently being managed. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, currently being managed by someone else, like someone else is doing that startup, right? Especially in the data space, it's like it's like what would I really come up with at this point if it was specifically data infra infrastructure that's not a saturated space, um, yeah. you know? So, so that's you know, if I had something, I'd do it. Um, Definitely easier to do a startup, consequently, in like the Martech space. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that that sounds like something like you you have. A <laughs> plenty of experience in um yes, i can tell you all about that if you want to go start a startup in the martech space i have a few ideas for you what, what what's an idea or or, <laughs> or is this something that we have to talk about off, yeah, offline yeah, talk about it off <laughs> all right uh what is this oh here's a question that we might have missed um all right so when to push for real time versus batch and the potential extra infra that's kind of needed with real time so i think you know in general depending on your use case, if you actually want to deploy infrastructure to be able to manage real time, you need engineers to manage it. And, and I'd say that as a plural because it is plural. Um, and so you, you need to make sure that you understand the costs. You can get at the value of, of um, batch very quickly and, and, and cheaply with low upfront investment at least. Um, so that that's definitely the cost consideration of the, the piece now. 
Mm -hmm. I think in the future, like very, very near future that all these paradigms are going to change. And, you know, like that's the reason we started our company at least. Um, so it has to be a use case that justifies that, that difference in cost. Um, the extra infrastructure, as I mentioned, it's going to be probably depending on the scale, you could probably get away with a lot less than this, but most people jump right to Kafka or something like that. Um, you can get a managed version of Kafka from Confluent for a thousand bucks a month. Um, so that's, you know, the baseline if you don't want to manage it yourself. Um, and then you're going to have to, depending on your use case, of course, manage something like the BZM and, um, and potentially a streaming, uh, transformation system too. So that's, that's, uh, kind of my view of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always plenty of work. Um, let's see. Uh, so someone asked about, uh, streaming transformers. I don't think we covered this specifically. I mean, obviously I think you referenced, you guys have built something into estuary, but, uh, other mm -hmm. than that, where, what other tools kind of have, do you think of when you think of streaming transforms? I, I love the concept of like materialize, right? They're... Oh, well, that was his, <laughs> yeah. He's like, and just learn. <laughs> yeah. So th there's some gotchas with like KSQL equal DB. Yeah. Um, it, like sometimes you'll have trouble with scaling mm. when it comes to, you know, SQL based streaming transforms that have interstate and manage interstate. That's definitely something to, to think about, right? Like when you issue a SQL query to a data warehouse like Snowflake, that SQL query is going to come back. That's not the case for a streaming system. Um, and that's something that like, I think it's just, you know, if you want to get that answer, you might have to go to Flink or Spark or something like that. Yeah, which is what Val is just like, we do transforms, but as well, Spark. So Spark's definitely, I think, the, the current winner for a lot of people for, for many reasons for that. I think, um, what do you call it? I know Airbnb is pretty much bet, pretty pretty big on it and, and other people. And, and even at Facebook, when I left, we were kind of shifting a lot of our stuff over even from Presto to Spark on, on some for some use cases. So it's that um, Databricks marketing budget, right? Well, but Spark's not necessarily Databricks, right? Like, it's like it's not like you're not going to see Databricks inside of Facebook. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's an open source project, of course. Okay, okay. Oh, you just mean in general? Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. No, they 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 are marketing hard. Uh, I I always see that like dog uh, Twitter uh, one where it's like your data, you know, data warehouse. It's like a sad dog with a <laughs> cone on it. And then it's like data lake house. It's like this, these happy dogs running um, free and, and pretty good marketing, right? <laughs> it, it's very memorable. I always remember it. Um, Consequently, how do you feel about this term? You talked about terms before um, lake house. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, sometimes it just feels very, very marketing heavy. Like to some degree, it's like, it kind of makes sense because you're like, yeah. And a lot, a lot of people are using this, this methodology where it's like, you've separated storage and compute literally to the point where it's like two different companies sometimes or, or two very, very different products. And so it's, you kind of do have this like more structured data lake than we did, you know, when we first started this whole data yeah. lake approach um, where tables exist, everything's in like parquet files, et cetera. And then you're reading it with Presto or, Pars or Spark or something else is, is, is doing the processing. So mm -hmm. to some degree, it's like, yeah, we're a lot of companies are starting to follow this kind of. Um, I just... I don't know. It, it always, I feel like always ends up leaning towards back towards like a, a data warehouse like exactly. mentality still. It's just like, but you're still kind of building the same process. It's just un the underlying system is now uh, maybe more of this abstracted away data lake, right? Like it's, it's a data lake, but we've kind of treated it like it's a data warehouse. So yeah. Or it's um, a data warehouse, but you're using external tables or something, you know, like it's kind of similar to that. Yeah. So, but you know, the, uh, People, terms are going to term. It's, it's part of this current uh, iteration where we're trying to like put out, everyone's like, let's just put out everything we can and whatever sticks we'll keep and whatever doesn't we'll, you know, get rid of and we'll, we'll have. Yeah, that's the, that's an issue, right? Like with the current world, you almost have to make your own term. Otherwise, no one knows what to call you. And then you end up with one term per company at worst. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, but I mean, like you referenced earlier, there's some consolidation. We've seen like reverse ETL now be added into like every company, um, right? Like every company has added it into their their product, right? I think it was Segment and M Particle that recently added something similar to that. And absolutely, yeah, they so, they uh, they can push to the data warehouse. Is that what they're doing, or is it... they can push out of it now into your Salesforce or whatever or wherever they're going? 
that, that's the goal, right? Like it's like now pushing out, pushing in, pushing every which direction, which to me is very similar to iPass, but different, I guess, um, since it's from the data warehouse and not another application. Um, Makes it a little easier, I guess, to, to manage what you're pushing. And that's, that's the main difference. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, again, you're, you're now like you have your own products like high touch and senses, but then you have like companies that are like, you know, whatever, M particle segment, I think rudder stack, uh, who else is doing it? I don't know. There's, there's probably more people doing it. Did they all announce at the same time? I, I saw that. Um, they do. <laughs> you always wonder, because like, I think, yeah, like uh, earlier this year, I think it was like Rudderstack, Airbyte, and there might have been one other company that like kind of all did something reverse at ETLE, either purchasing it or something. Right. And then, yeah, then like literally like the same day segment and, and Particle announced and you're just like, so y'all just have lunch with each other or something? <laughs> Are we missing? Like, am I not part of the cool kids group? Like, I don't know. You have to yeah. wonder at some level of whether it was just like a marketing announcement for some of them that was like, I don't want to be left out. Yeah. Real. yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like half of, you know, these things are always just like a marketing announcement. Like even the Salesforce Snowflake announcement, it's like, okay, they've announced it. Can but I it use probably that? won't be let it ready for a year if it comes out, right? Like, or, yeah. or they may be hoping to see like, if no one's interested, we'll just kill it and just move on. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure. Um, what is it? Snow Snowpipe? Is that still in alpha right now? I don't know. I, I thought it was out like beyond alpha, but yes, there's also that. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, it's part of part of the whatever feature development process. You got to hype it up, see if anyone's interested, <laughs> and, then and then go, like, for, it then go <laughs> for it or not. I mean, otherwise you end up like, uh, uh, sorry, Meta, but Meta with like billions of dollars currently invested in, in the metaverse. Oh, wow. That's a really great question for you. This is good timing <laughs> to ask you questions on what you think about Zuck. <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't have any like thoughts in any direction. I, I feel bad, right? Like the layoffs were announced today. I feel very, very bad for that. Um, yeah. cause I, I work with like tons of smart people, like people far smarter than me. Um, people with PhDs that were doing cool stuff. And so it's, it's, it's always sad to hear. Was um, it engineering mostly? I, I didn't actually dive into it. I don't know who, like which teams, but I, I know that there, there have been some engineering, um, teams that have been, you know, reduced in size or, and so it's, it's hard. Like that's always hard. It's great because, you know, there's plenty of other companies that will hopefully benefit from all this talent and I hope everyone gets hired tomorrow um but it, it's a bummer just because getting there's no way getting laid off feels good like right. just no way like you know it, it's and like getting rejected lot, like tech recently that's been a decent amount of layoffs with twitter laying off half the company yeah um so hopefully everything will get under control soon but so what about the metaverse do you think that that's you know how we're going to be building data pipelines soon <laughs> I don't know. Like I, currently, what I've seen, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan. But I, I don't know. Like I know some people like it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm usually like not. I'm not a late adopter. I'm kind of somewhere in like the 30th percentile, maybe 40th percentile of adopting things. So I'm, I usually wait for it to be like, all right, this is enough people that I feel like this is going to stick around. Um, so just looking at it now, I'm just like, I. I don't know. It feels like uh, what, what's that Nintendo Nintendo Wii Sports kind of kind of vibe to it. I'm sure they'll go beyond that. It's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Like, if, if they get there, they get there, and they'll you know completely. They have to. They yeah. have to get there. It's just about like whether the market's the size that Zuck thinks the market is. Yeah. And but I think the I think the product will be cool, and it probably has more direct applicability in use cases than Bitcoin does. Yes, um, <laughs> I, I think that's a fair way. Of <laughs> someone, someone get mad at me for for saying that with Bitcoin, but yes, I, I think that's. I was that's surprised you agreed with me right away. I thought I was saying something that was a little bit. <laughs> I don't know personally. It's just based on what I've seen. I, I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. After FTX, just <laughs> yeah, it's been a it's been a very uh, busy week in tech. You know, um, you know, uh, yeah, busy week. FTX getting that that was some interesting. Like I, I've been. Uh, not reading, but listening to um, Barbarians at the Gates. Um, I don't, have you read that book? I haven't, no. It's too long, but I've been reading it or listening to it recently. And I'm just like, it, it was basically that, but in like a week. Because like this, this whole, the Barbarians at the Gates was like a months long thing. But for like Nabisco, um, mm -hmm. I always forget the cigarette company that was involved, but Nabisco, whatever, getting taken over. Um, but yeah, like FTX in like one week, just because uh, what's his name said something bad about Binance. <laughs> like, Binance is like, all right, <laughs> we're gonna fuck with you <laughs> and buy you. Just like, damn. Yeah, it's pretty crazy to see that. Uh, yeah, 
it's just just a uh, yeah it's, it's 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 been a very it's it's i wonder if this is kind of what it felt like um again back in that like 1970s 1980s like uh, corporate takeover time because like that's what we're, we keep seeing like twitter had that kind of happen where elon's like i'm gonna buy you they're like no yeah. no 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 but no, that no. one we have to look at as being like i don't know elon is he's classically been pretty good at making things profitable but oh yeah this I, is oh you, you're okay i see if you go the other way I it with debt 43 or whatever billion dollars yeah. of, you know that's he's got some interest payments coming up that's going to be a hard ship to turn around it, it will be but i i guess i more mean like it's just been like these weird corporate takeovers where it like almost sometimes feels personal yeah. um, you know it's like it's like i just want to take you over because i want to f, f with you kind of situation it's like oh, okay yeah. um absolutely it's just, it's just yeah well, I, I don't want to keep you here all day. I appreciate your time, David. I think you've, you've explained a lot of interesting things, both about streaming, startups, et cetera. Do you have any other questions? And, and thanks, sorry, if we didn't get to your question in the last little bit. I just want to kind of make sure we, we wrap up. And, and uh, yeah, anything else you have to ask before we kind of end this? No. All right, I'm going to hit end. Thank you all for joining. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to hit end. Thank you all.